All right, so thank you everyone. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute your microphones and turn off your video camera. Uh, this program is going to be recorded today and will be later available on the uh, Oregon Capitals uh, YouTube channel. So, um, and then I'd also like to uh, let you know that um, after the film, we will be taking questions. And so please feel free to type them in the chat. And uh, hope you come up since, with some good questions for our filmmakers. So, all right, hello, my name is Carol Suzuki, Chair of the Capital Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. I'd like to welcome you to today's live presentation of the film, Breaking the Curfew, the Minoru Yasui story. I know it's a beautiful day outside and to know that you are choosing more screen time is truly a compliment in itself. So you guys are all in for a real treat. Today's program is brought to you by the Capital DEI, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee and the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. Uh, today we'll hear from two very impressive high school students, Alan Zo and Kyler Wong, who will introduce their award-winning documentary chronicling the life of Minoru Yasui, a Japanese American lawyer and civil rights leader who fought against the curfew of Japanese Americans and the unjust incarceration of over 120,000 people of Japanese descent in American concentration camps during World War II. Uh, we'll watch the 10 minute documentary together and then discuss the film and current events with our filmmakers. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to, for all of us to take a moment to pause and reflect on the recent massacre of eight people in Atlanta, Georgia, six of whom were Asian women who were killed at point blank range. Please join me. Thank you. This was a horrible event that has topped off what has been a difficult number of years for people of Asian descent and their loved ones where we've seen violence steadily on the rise across the country and even here in Oregon. Uh, locally here in Salem, a female Willamette University student was attacked in broad daylight within blocks of the Oregon State Capitol. So this is very real. Um, so what I'd like is for folks to Take a moment and think of a loved one, a family member or a friend or a colleague who may need some reassurance that they and recognize that they may need a little more support right now. And I hope you'll reach out to them in the days to come. And while these events are horrible, um, it's important that we not look away and that we face it together by speaking out, educating others and keeping our community safe. And this is why the story of Minori Yasui's place in history continues to be important and needs to be elevated. I'm heartened that Alan and Kyler chose Minori Yasui as the subject of their film. Yeah. The only thing they say you can really do is go visit somebody else's head. Oh, so that's... Um, several months ago, I was contacted by Maya Yasui. It's a longtime family friend from my hometown of Hood River after screening this film, about screening this film at the Oregon State Capitol in commemoration of Minoru Yasui Day, which falls on March 28th in perpetuity in Oregon. And together we've worked on numerous pieces of legislation that bring some measure of justice to the survivors of the internment of Japanese Americans. And among those survivors are, on a personal note, my grandparents, father, and other family members who were all taken and incarcerated at internment camps in Tule Lake, California, and in Minidoka, Idaho, uh, which is where uh, Min uh, was was imprisoned later in the war. Um, and in this moment, I'd also like to um, recognize uh, Lynn Fujikami, the executive director of JAMO, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. And we're also honored to have Peggy Nagai, the lead attorney in Min Minori Yasui's case before the Oregon Supreme Court. Uh, they are joining us today on, on this call. So thank you both for being here so much. And now let me introduce our filmmakers. Alan is a junior at Sunset High School in Portland, where he is co-president of the nationally recognized speech and debate team and captain of the mock trial team. And outside of school, he enjoys creating videos, is involved with Project Lotus, a youth-led organization 
aimed at destigmatizing mental health in Asian American communities. He also serves on the student contest committee of the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project, which holds an annual essay contest for students across the country. And Kyler is a junior at Lincoln High School in Portland, where he is the editor in chief of the school magazine, an alumni of the nationally recognized constitution team and a player on the water polo team. He is also founder of Spark Team, an organization with the mission of seeding diverse founders into entrepreneurial ecosystems. Alan and Kyler won gold at the 2020 National History Day contest that is held annually in Washington, DC. Uh, national History Day is a national history competition with over a half a million participants annually, with roughly 3,000 students qualifying for the national competition. So among those students, Alan and Kyler won gold and represented Oregon proudly. And so they won in first in the senior group documentary category at the national competition and were named National Endowment for the Humanities Scholars. So now I'll hand it off to Alan and Kyler. If you could just tell us um, what prompted you to um, put together a film on Minori Yasui. Yeah, so we actually found out about Minori Yasui after coming across an exhibit in the Oregon Historical Society Museum. And we were immediately fascinated by his story and his lifelong fight for justice. As Oregonians, we had never even heard of Minori Yasui, who was born and raised just 60 miles east of our high schools. And so after we found out about Minori Yasui, we spent the next couple of months digging through the archives of the Oregon Historical Society, and also speaking with people, including Peggy Nagai, who's in the audience right now, and uh, George Nakata, who spoke here in October of 2019, people who had known him and worked with him firsthand. And finally, at the very end, we compiled all of this research, all of our interviews into a 10 minute film, which we submitted to National History Day. And that's the film you guys are watching today. Yeah, and his story inspired us not only to create this documentary, but to also get involved with the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project, working towards its goal in preserving his legacy and mission. This year, we helped organize the Minoru Yasui Student Contest, which prompted students to write an insightful essay exploring refugee and immigrant, immigrant experiences through the lens of Min's work. Min stood up to injustice and racism against his community, despite all odds being stacked against him and knowing that it would personally harm him. And his example is especially important right now as violence shakes some Asian American communities across the country. And it's during these times that we all need to take a stand and, and take a lesson from Minori Yasui. And so uh, we hope you enjoy your film and, and uh, learn something about Minori Yasui. In the weeks following Pearl Harbor, the American public was locked in a state of fear. Never before had the country been attacked so suddenly by a foreign adversary on its own soil. The nation fired on all cylinders, working towards the cause of preserving American democracy. Fearful and defensive, Americans sought unity through scrap metal drives, victory gardens, and gas rations but also through propaganda campaigns targeting people of Japanese ancestry. Japanese Americans were depicted as dangerous saboteurs who were subversive to the war effort, a sentiment that was reinforced by rampant misinformation and xenophobia. In Portland, Oregon, a young attorney worked furiously to resolve the new legal challenges faced by his community. A second generation Japanese American, Minoru Yasui, had been raised on the orchards of Hood River, Oregon, where a wave of immigrants settled in the early 1900s against the idyllic backdrop of the Columbia River. As the century progressed, the community in Hood River found itself the subject of increasing antagonism from the general public. The economic success of Hood River's orchards, combined with the widespread belief that the Japanese were unassimilable, caused many to resent the newfound community. In 1917 in Oregon, the first bill for an anti-alien land law in Oregon was actually submitted by a Hood River senator. And two years later, Hood River formed an anti-alien association. It was in this uncertain environment that Yasui grew up. He excelled in school, 
becoming the first American citizen of Japanese descent to graduate from the University of Oregon School of Law and to pass the Oregon Bar. A second lieutenant in the ROTC, Yasui reported for military duty after Pearl Harbor, but was turned away because of his heritage. In the weeks following, the government began arresting Japanese community leaders, subjecting them to hours of searches and interrogations. Among those arrested was Yasui's father, Masuo, who was taken to a detention camp in Montana. Evidence used against him included children's drawings of the Panama Canal, which the authorities believed was proof of espionage. Tides continued to shift against the Japanese Americans as the government ramped up its efforts to restrict the population. The man leading the charge was Lieutenant General John DeWitt, who had previously spent over four decades in uniform. Stern and uncompromising, DeWitt would stop at nothing to protect the West Coast against what he saw as a dire military threat. He also said to a congressional committee, quote, a Jap's a Jap, unquote. And the type of racism that he's expressing is that because of genetics or blood, you are destined to be disloyal. DeWitt's radical ideas eventually made their way to the White House. On February 19th, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, delegating unilateral power to DeWitt and other military leaders. DeWitt, now with the force of the executive order behind him, passed a series of military proclamations in the following weeks. Among these was a curfew, requiring all persons of Japanese ancestry to remain in their homes after 8 p.m. The curfew stood as another manifestation of the public's fear, a legitimization of the country's distrust toward the Japanese. It makes you feel inferior. It makes you singled out. It makes your ethnic group degraded, demoralized. Minoru Yasui believed the curfew order to be not only a violation of his personal liberties, but a betrayal of the spirit and letter of the Constitution. But to challenge this barrier of injustice meant facing the full force of the US government, a daunting task for a young attorney. Yet his resolve did not waver. I felt that we owed at least the obligation as a citizen to tell our government they are wrong. That is the sacred duty of every citizen. Because what is done to the least of us can be done to all of us. I knew that we had to protest this. On a Saturday night in March of 1942, Yasui left his law office to take a walk in downtown Portland, deliberately violating the curfew. At only 25 years old, Yasui was willing to sacrifice his life and liberty to fight for justice. I walked for over three hours, and during that period, I got tired of walking up and down Third Avenue, so I did approach a police officer. So he went up to the policeman and um, asked to be arrested, and the policeman said, go home, Sonny, you're going to get in trouble. So he actually walked into the Portland police station and said, here are my papers, I'm Japanese American, it's after the curfew, uh, please arrest me. The sergeant obliged me and he threw me into the drunk tank, so that's how the case began at 11.20 p.m., 28th day of March, 1942. At his trial, the judge sentenced him to a year in prison and a $5,000 fine. He was held in solitary confinement for nine months in a six by eight foot windowless cell. Yasui kept fighting, ultimately bringing his case before the Supreme Court. The court heard his case alongside a similar one, Hirabayashi v. United States, in which a student in Washington was convicted of violating the same curfew that Yasui had a month earlier. In the trial, the government argued that the curfew was a military necessity and that certain racial characteristics of Japanese Americans justified the order. With the unanimous ruling on June 21st, 1943, Yasui's conviction was upheld. <laughs> Having served his sentence, Yasui traded one prison for another. He was taken to Minidoka Relocation Center, where he and thousands of Japanese were incarcerated until the end of the war. Conditions in the camp were bleak. I'm listening. I hear men whispering. I hear babies crying. I hear women weeping. What am I listening to? I am listening to the sounds of shattered lives. Shattered lives 
120,000 Japanese. Upon release, Yasui moved to Denver, Colorado, where he continued to fight for civil rights. With the Japanese American Citizens League, he lobbied against racist legislation and chaired the National Committee for Redress, uniting individuals across the nation in the campaign for a government apology and restitution for wartime incarceration. Not because it affected 120,000 Japanese Americans, but it affects all Americans. In 1983, Yasui, along with a team of lawyers, petitioned to reopen his World War II case, citing new evidence suggesting the curfew was not based on military necessity, but on race. The district court vacated his conviction, but refused to rule on the issue of racial discrimination. Yasui persisted, once again appealing his case. Over 40 years after he broke the curfew in downtown Portland, Yosui was still determined to right the wrongs committed by the government. But on November 12, 1986, Yosui died from cancer while waiting for his case to be heard. His ashes were buried beneath a pair of giant cedars in his hometown of Hood River. Just two weeks after his passing, the Supreme Court declined to hear his case, ruling it moot since the petitioner was deceased. His decades-long legal battle had come to an end. However, Minoru Yasui's legacy carried on. Two years after his death, President Reagan issued a formal apology and reparations for victims of incarceration, marking a victory for the redress movement. In 2015, Yasui was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the country. And a year later, the Oregon legislature designated March 28th, the day he broke the curfew, as Minoru Yasui Day, immortalizing his act of courage. I think his legacy is that as one person, you can literally change the world. He was committed to justice. He was committed to his family, his community. He fought for us. At just 25 years old, Minoru Yasui put his reputation, career, and personal liberties on the line to challenge the government's wrongdoing. For Yasui, fighting against injustice was not a choice, but an obligation. He lived life by a simple motto, one he would often repeat. We are born into this world for a purpose, to make it a better place for our having been there. As old barriers persist and new barriers emerge, Yasui's actions serve as an example to all. It begins with an act of courage, even something as simple as a late night stroll. All right, thank you so much, Alan and Kyler. That was amazing. And so now I'd like to um, open it up for questions for our young filmmakers. Let me see if we've got anything in the chat. And um, I know you've just watched the film, but if you would like to type in a question, please, please feel free to do so. But um, so Alan and Kyler, how did you get started in film? Yeah, so we actually started working on National History Day, uh, the competition in eighth grade. We went to the same middle school and we were assigned uh, this documentary project as an assignment in class. And we did our first project on the Pig War, a little known event in northern Washington where a standoff was caused by the death of a pig between the British and the Americans. And that uh, also went to the National History Day contest and we ended up getting fourth place. And then the following year, we did another film on Salado Falls, which is another local event. And for that year, we got first place um, nationally. And so the past year, we did our documentary on Min Yasui. And so for, for film specifically, that's mostly Alan, because back in middle school, we both liked history. We we're pretty big history nerds. We did like history. We started like a history B club at our school, and we did all, all kinds of history work. And then Alan was also into film, so he he's an excellent filmmaker. And so we thought, OK, perfect. National History Day, we can make a documentary about history. That's a perfect combination for us. And so that really brought us to the competition initially. Excellent. Um, so one of the questions is, since the video, how has it impacted you and what you do? I think 
what what Minoru Yasui inspired, how it, how it inspires me and how, you know, the lesson I think we can take away the most is that just such a simple action of taking a late night walk, you know, such a strong act of courage and such a simple action. I think, you know, there, there are countless times in our lives when we can take a stand where it feels uncomfortable to stand up for ourselves or stand up for our values, but we can do it. It's, it's standing in a line at the coffee shop and the person behind you says, the Chinese virus or the or Kung flu and, and correcting them. Those tiny acts of courage are really what count. So I think that's that's the greatest inspiration I've drawn in that video. Yeah, and I think Min Yasui's story shows that this type of violence and racism, although in different forms, has always existed and will continue to exist. So that's why it's so important to always be able to speak out and notice when something's wrong and stand up about it like Min Yasui did. Um, I guess, uh, let's see, it's like, do you have other projects in the works and do you have aspirations to continue making films? Yeah, so Kyler and I recently actually did another project um, for a competition called C-SPAN Student Camp, and it was a, a documentary about finding common ground and political polarization. So we're definitely still working on different projects. This year, we aren't doing another um, group project for National History Day, but I will be working. I am working on my own project um, in the individual category. So there will be another documentary in the works. All right. Um, what would you say to other high school students about expressing their leadership and courage? I think it's a, it's a time when it feels really, really hard to be courageous because there's so many of these artificial pressures around you that, that make it difficult. Like people, you know, all around me during in school, you'll you'll hear things that are, you know, that that might not align with your values, but it's also like you can't it, it, like standing up means that it isn't cool, right? It's not comfortable to stand up or or say, hey, like I didn't I didn't like what you said there, or I don't think what you said is right. Um, and so I think I mean that that goes back. That's a very specific type of courage, but I think I think it it's there's something deeper there that. Like, sure, Minoru Yasui knew that that he would get in trouble, right? He spent nine years and nine months in solitary confinement because of his actions, but he did it anyway. And so I think that's the that's sort of the courage we need to see more, even when it feels really, really uncomfortable. Great. Um, what do you see for your future? Do you think you might run for office someday or how might... Do you think that something you'll do in the future would be to somehow um, impact public policy in some way? Yeah, I think, you know, for me personally, film is a powerful tool to express different types of ideas, and that's why I'm really interested in it. So I don't know about public office, but I'll definitely be <laughs> um, pursuing some uh, field related to film uh, in the future, whether it be for relating to history or just filmmaking in general. Yeah. For me, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm not really sure what what lies ahead for me. Um, you know, definitely not closing any doors. So, public office isn't something that I've like. It's not something that like I'm definitely going to be running for public office in the future. But it's it's like it's still an open door for me. But I'll just see kind of where life takes me. Well, I'd say you have you have some time to think about it for sure. So. Uh, do you know where you might be interested in going to school uh, for college? That's a question. I, I feel like that's a question that's been on our mind a lot lately. <laughs> we've got to, we're, we're applying soon. I'm, I'm thinking California would be a good place to go to school. I just really like the culture and the weather, of course, um, but not nothing too specific yet. Yeah, same here. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I imagine your parents are really proud of you. I mean, it's uh, pretty, I would say probably pretty rare for for someone to repeat as the in the gold award. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the competition uh, was like? Yeah, so so National History Day is, is kind of like science fair for history, except there are a bunch of different categories. So you don't have to make a board. You can also make a documentary or write a paper. And, and so there's the Oregon History Day hosted by the Oregon Historical Society. Um, and then from there, you qualify to the national competition. And, and going nationals is super great because you've got all these rooms 
at the University of Maryland um, opened up for viewing documentaries. You can walk around and see incredible boards, um, like really, really incredible. It's hard to describe until you actually see it. You'll have, you know, archival newspapers on the boards from 19, the 1920s. You'll have, you know, ice buckets where you can reach in and feel what it was like, like to be in the English Channel, things like that. And, and so going to nationals was super incredible experience. And I think National History Day is definitely a big game changer for both of us. Yeah, but this past year with our Minya Sui documentary, the competition was actually virtual, unfortunately, because of because of COVID. And um, that was really a, a drastic change because the past years we've always gone to DC and we've always like toured the, the monuments. And then at the actual contest, there would be a, a, a award ceremony with a parade in, in the stadium. And it was really cool. And so this past year, it's been different, but we are so glad to have the opportunity to you know share our film with people and get that gold medal for Oregon. Uh, we're we're very proud of your accomplishments and um, just so fortunate to have you both representing Oregon. And you know, for people like myself who've been involved with um, you know legislation advocacy on these issues, um, I know that um, we have a great future and in leaders and like yourself. So I just want to thank you so much for sharing your film with us and spending some time. Um, at this point in the program, I'd just like to uh, turn it over to um, Lynn Fuchikami of the Executive Director of the Japanese American Museum of Oregon to offer a few comments and to talk about a couple other events that are, are happening uh, this weekend and uh, as well as the reopening of the museum. So uh, take it away, Lynn. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, yes, you'd think after all the time we've spent doing these things, I'd, I'd have that one down. Um, thank you, Carol, and, and good afternoon, everyone. First, I just really wanted to congratulate Kyler and Alan um, again on their award-winning award films and um, really all the work that they're doing. Um, I'm really glad that they had an opportunity to share it with everyone today. And I, I wanted to acknowledge also um, all the great work that they're doing now as part of the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project. They've just brought uh, tremendous energy and really engaged a new audience, which is really our, our future leaders. So thank you, Kyler and Alan, so much. Um, so the mission of our museum is to preserve and honor the history of the Japanese Americans in the Pacific Northwest, educate the public about the Japanese American experience during World War II, and advocate for the protection of civil rights for all. And I wanted to share just some exciting updates about our newly relocated museum that is scheduled to open in May. So the new museum is located at uh, Northwest 4th and Flanders, really just four blocks from our previous location and still within the um, uh, boundaries of what was once Portland's very large and vibrant Japantown. So we share this history through immersive and interactive exhibits, um, including a partial barrack recreated from actual wood from the, the um, historic Minidoka site, which was uh, the concentration camp where the majority of the people from Portland were incarcerated. And um, perhaps the most highly anticipated exhibit is uh, Min's actual jail cell. So it was a four-year project where we um, extracted and preserved the actual cell where Min was incarcerated um, in solitary confinement for nine months. Um, and that, that included moving it and then reinstalling it into our new museum location um, where you'll be able to actually stand within the walls of the tiny cell, see his Presidential Medal of Freedom and hear in his own words what it, what it was like uh, to be confined there. So we, you know, we really share this history, not as something from the past, but to fight for justice and equality to ensure our future. And especially now with all the horrific anti-Asian acts of violence and, and the rise in hate and racism, we realize that our mission and that uh, the legacy of Minoru Yasui is more important and relevant um, than ever before. So we invite you to join us um, for our virtual opening celebration on May 6th. And then we'd also like to invite you, um, along with the Minoru Yasui Legacy Project, um, join us for our, our annual Minoru Yasui Day program from 1 to 3. 
And this year it focuses on immigrants and refugees, the path to justice, and it features a fireside chat with Peggy Nagai and Senator Maisie Hirono, um, who will be discussing national issues and legislation related to immigrants and refugees. And it's also going to include um, a panel of civic leaders with, with calls to action. Um, it's free, but you'll need to register on the ACLU of Oregon's website. So um, in closing, I, I really wanted to extend our deep, deep appreciation to Carol and the Oregon State Legislature um, for the funding that was so critical to, to uh, the build out of our new museum. We would not have been able to, to do it without it. So just our deep appreciation. So again, um, please join us tomorrow for the program and uh, for the virtual opening celebration on May 6th. And, and perhaps most of all, we really look forward to welcoming you all in person to the museum. So please come and visit. Thank you, Carol. Oh, thank you, Lynn. No, um, you know, I'm so grateful that we were able to pull together a program and uh, recognize Minoria Sui Day in Oregon and just so proud to have Kyler and Alan um, and their good work. Um, I hope that uh, people that are, are tuning in today will um, share the film with others. And um, later when it's available, we'll have this uh, discussion that we had today available on the Capitol uh, YouTube channel. And uh, I will, for folks who attended today's program, uh, send out links to the event that um, Lynn mentioned, which is scheduled for tomorrow, um, as well as some information about the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. So uh, I just want to, again, also recognize and thank um, Maya Yasui and Peggy Nagai for just all of their work throughout the years on Japanese American issues and for being here today. Uh, it means a lot. And I want to thank all of you who've taken time this afternoon to join us and and um, hope you have a wonderful day and a great weekend. And I hope you'll tune in again for future programs with uh, hosted and sponsored by the Capital Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee. So thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye everyone.